Hi everyone. Um, is everyone having a good time? Yes. Hey. Um, so amazing. Uh, I'm not an English teacher, but I've been amazed at the, the standard of, um, of presentation so far. It's been phenomenal. Um, it's my, my honour at this point to be able to introduce um, Jennifer, Jennifer Webb. Um, she's an English teacher and assistant principal for teaching, learning and staff development at the Cobb Academy in Leeds. In the past, she's worked as a head of English, lead practitioner and an AST in a number of schools in West Yorkshire. Jenny is a best-selling author, How to Teach English Literature, Overcoming Cultural Poverty. She speaks at conferences. She writes a widely read teaching and learning blog, funkypedagogy.com, and tweets at funkypedagogy. Her new book, Teach Like a Writer, will be published by John Carr in April 2020. Um, I first met uh, Jennifer at Practical Pedagogies over in France a couple of years ago, and I've always been amazed by her, her ideas and her passion and her enthusiasm. She's an amazing person that I follow on Twitter and I enjoy engaging with. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jenny Webb. for these Saturday morning things, um, always says, you're completely insane, what is wrong with you, why are you giving me Saturday? And I'm like, well, because the people I'm going to see there are more fun than you, because they want to do this on a Saturday night me. Uh, so, um, so this is me. Um, if you want to tweet me or have a look at any of the things I'm talking about, I will put this presentation up on my blog today. Um, everything I talk about and everything that's in my books almost two books. Um, it's free on my website to download, so please just, even if you haven't bought the book, please just take all the stuff and run. Um, so this is what the second book is going to look like. I haven't actually shared this image with anyone yet. I've even put it on Twitter. So it's exciting. Oh, exclusive. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, it's quite um, so what I'm going to do today is kind of share some ideas from it, some really practical things, because I'm all about giving you stuff that you could use on Monday. Um, so, oh, one second, yeah. Probably important to just give you a tiny little bit of background about my school. So this is us, Co-op Academy Leeds. We're part of a trust, so the co-op, you know, as like the funeral care and shops and stuff. <laughs> they also have schools. Uh, and co-op is a little bit of a socialist cult, not gonna lie, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, uh, Co-op has a bit of a social mission and when Co-op was founded kind of 175 years ago in Rotherham, no, Rochdale, oh god, don't say Rotherham, I'm going to get, I'm gonna get fired now, this is going on the internet, um, in Rochdale 175 years ago, um, it was founded to give um, a better quality of life to workers in the north of England um, during the Industrial Revolution, but it also was founded with a massive kind of core of educational improvement for the community. So every single co-op shop had a room in the top that was for education. So they used to teach the local people how to read for free. Um, so it's always been about education for co-op. And in the last kind of 10 years, they've been building their academies program. Um, co-op Academy Leeds is very proud to be part of that academies program, but we're also quite unique within the trust and kind of nationally I would say. So just a quick one, my school is 85% EAL, 67% pupil premium officially, but about 20% of our children haven't been in the country long enough to claim benefits and therefore are not officially PP but they should be. So we're about 90% PP, um, but 20% of those are living below, below the poverty line because they're not even getting free school meals. Um, we have a significant proportion of students who are asylum seekers and refugees because where we're based in Leeds is where the Syrian and Afghan resettlement programmes are. Um, my school is doing some amazing things with our students. Uh, we have closed the gap in the majority of year groups with um, between PP students in our school and non-PP students nationally in terms of the kind of progress we make. We're doing a really, really, really good job in difficult circumstances. 
Um, the staff are incredible. And a lot of the things that I talk about, I think, when I write and when I do conferences and things, come out of the kind of challenge of working in this environment. But I believe very, very strongly that our school, if something works really well for our school, it tends to work elsewhere really well as well. Um, I'm all about high aspirations and challenge and rigour. And just because a child is um, coming from what is one of the most socially deprived areas in the UK, it's North East Leeds, um, that doesn't mean we can't teach them the most difficult stuff, the best stuff, expose them to the most um, rigorous curriculum that we possibly can. That's really, really important. Let's not patronise these kids back into poverty. Um, so, that's what I'm about. So, this is my kind of little mantra that I kind of tell myself all the time. And this comes out of my experience as a child. I grew up in the community where I now teach. So my career started at Leeds Grammar School, or sorry, the Grammar School at Leeds, which is one of the best private schools in the country and certainly one of the best in the north of England. Um, absolutely incredible place, but it's a private school. I worked there for three years. Moved on to other schools in between, but I'm now at Cal, which is obviously a very, very different kind of place. Um, but I was one of those kids. I was one of the kids in that community um, where I'm teaching now. And I think that this is what I wanted. I wanted my teachers to give me the most ambitious, the most academic experience they possibly could because that was what was appropriate for me. Um, this is really important though that we unpick this because ambitious, what are our ambitions? What are we intending to do for our students? Um, what are we ultimately trying to achieve? Because real ambition is not just about exam results. Real ambition, because that it just means if my only ambition for my students is that I want to pass this exam or I want them to do really, really well in the exam, great. But that's not that ambitious. That's got, there's no imagination there whatsoever. We know we want them to do well in the exam. That's our job and that's what we're judged on for some reason. But actually, real ambition is about teaching beyond the exam. I'd like to think that all the English teachers in this room have ambitions for their children that they will be writers to some extent in their lives. And that doesn't mean they're published necessarily, but these are people who will be adults who will be empowered to write, empowered to create, empowered to write themselves into the world around them. And that's really, really important. So even if that just means they can write a bloody good letter or application for a job, that still makes them a writer. And they're the kinds of ambitions we need to have. We need to see beyond an exam. Um, <clears throat> and what does academic mean? This is really, really important. It's a very, very political issue. Um, we have to decide what we think academic means. We have to decide what is worthy. And worthy is... <sighs> it's fraught with politics around gender, race, class, all sorts of really, really complicated things that a lot of people don't like talking about, and I think we do need to talk about them because then they become less taboo. Um, so deciding what's worthy and what is not is really, really important. Um, so, for thinking about being worthy <coughs> in English, we often think before we put something in our curriculum, particularly key stage three, where we actually have a choice. Um, who wrote it? Is that a person that's worthy? Okay. We need to stop thinking about that because saying who wrote it is going to lead us down the path of, well, let's teach Hardy because we're all comfortable with Hardy. We all know Hardy's worth it. Although I don't like teaching Hardy and I hate tests. It stresses me right out. <laughs> uh, when we think about who wrote it, we just fall back on the things that we're comfortable with. And I think that's a problem. What we really, really need to be thinking about is what that text provides our students. It's not academic because it was written by a dead white man in the Victorian period. It's a brilliant text because it provides complex, intelligent crafting of language. Okay, so there are lots of brilliant dead white men who wrote great texts that do those things, and I love them all. But there are lots of other writers who do those things as well, really, really, really well, and we have to find who those people are. Um, do the, does the text provide elements which will provide challenge for our students? Is it something that you can envisage in your classroom? Oh, look at that line. That's rock hard. Let's unpick that. that we need to spend some time on this. Is it going to push them? Okay. Does it provide something different? So are we giving them a range of form, genre, style? We also have to remember that these things are not the same as they were 50 years ago either. So that's really important. Form, genre and style changes kind of 
and, and actually, in a world now where people can write a poem in a thread on Twitter, or they can create something really, really, really powerful through a series of short videos, form, genre, and style, like what that means, has been blown out of the water, and we really, really need to be able to think about that as well, because those things, while we still need to respect and understand the more traditional things that are a bit more static, we must, must, must acknowledge that our subject is amazing because it is evolving before our eyes, okay? Um, opportunity for depth. So, is there opportunity for linguistic exploration? Um, is there opportunity for us to link to theory and theory perspectives? So, when I'm teaching drama, am I thinking about performance theory and carnival theory? And can I link things into... Um, Things that people are saying now about literature, things that people said 50 years ago about literature, because that's really important. Controversy. Is it something that upsets some people? Because often that's a sign that it's quite good. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, why the literary connection or conversation? So, I'm interested in whether or not my texts that I choose are in conversation with other texts in conversation with other ideas, other writers. So, is there a classical link? Is there a biblical link? Is there a political conversation that's going on with this text? Are there other literary texts which this text is in conversation with? So, for example, we might teach something which is a direct response to something else. So, if you look at Upon Westminster Bridge by Wordsworth and London by Blake, those two poems are in direct conversation with each other. And so when we teach one, it's interesting to link to the other. Those two poems are great poems, I love them. And they do these things, but this is the most interesting one for me, is how those two writers are kind of talking to each other. Um, key perspectives. Now, this is important. Perspectives. I'm not going to talk about diversity because I don't like the word diversity. I'd rather talk about representation and perspectives. So diversity means, here's the Keystone Street curriculum. I've sprinkled in a little bit of John Agard and uh, Grace Nichols, and so we're good to go, man. It's great. We are well diverse. You're not. You're not diverse. Okay. Um, especially if the poems you've chosen are just about being black, because that's not diverse. Okay. Black writers can write about flowers, they can write about sunsets, they can write about pain and loss and love and all of those things. They don't just have to write about how hard it is to be black. Those poems are great as well, but what I worry about is that we choose texts and say, oh, this is too diverse, or this is an LGBT perspective, or this is a female writer, well done us. But actually, we're not really thinking about what those texts are telling our students, okay? I'd rather see texts, personally, um, where our students are seeing writers from a range of different perspectives and viewpoints who are just being human and talking about the human experience. So if the only text we teach in Keystone Three by a female writer pre-1900 is about how hard it is to be a girl, maybe have a think, have a look at yourself and like think about maybe expanding a little bit. But yeah, have the debate, be prepared to debate that in your departments. Be prepared to ask really difficult questions and think, right, here are some options we've got on the table, here are some perspectives on the table, what do we want in there, what is going to help our students, okay? So, it's really important when we decide <laughs> what kinds of texts we teach and what is academic and what is ambitious, that we're being snobs about the things which matter, okay? Don't be a snob about, is it in the canon though, okay? Because that's not a helpful guide anymore. Things have changed too much for that to be a helpful guide as to what we should teach. Be a snob about the things that matter. Is the text itself challenging? Is it interesting? Is it going to do something for our students? And is it going to help them understand that there are more perspectives out there than just kind of a white British middle class one as well? Okay, really, really, really important. So, yeah. Be snobs, be academic snobs. Be like, well that's too easy, I'm not teaching that. And I say that all the time. Um, <laughs> but let's focus on the actual text rather than who wrote it. Um, so, I'm going to talk about teaching writing, or as I've started to call it, the desperate pit into which we have fallen as a profession. Um, <laughs> the, reason I'm <laughs> the reason I'm writing the book I'm writing at the moment is that I feel very strongly that as English teachers, 
there's like a secret that we never really talk about, and it's that none of us really know what we're doing when we're teaching writing quite a lot of the time. Everyone's like, ah. it's true though. Um, I've, I've worked with a handful of people who are actual writers, like who teach, who are writers in their spare time. So I had a colleague at my previous school who was writing a fantasy novel. Surprise, surprise, she was a great creative writing teacher because she lived it, yeah? I've worked with people who write poetry, even if it's bad poetry, they're still thinking about poetry from a creative viewpoint and therefore they're really good at teaching kids how to write poetry. Most of us are too scared to even attempt. Put your hand up if you have this year tried to actually teach children how to write proper poems. And haikus don't count, <laughs> right? Haikus are great, I'm just, I, but getting a child to write 15 haikus in an hour is not an achievement. So, anybody? Tiny, tiny proportion of a few people. Well done. Well done, brave souls. Um, but it's really, really, really difficult. And the reason for that is because we're not writers. So we have to teach so many different things. And that's exactly what Arlene said in her talk. The wide range of disciplines that English teachers are uh, expected to deliver is insane. Like, it's massive. Um, and we have to do it across time periods and genres as well. So I think that... Most of us are literature specialists, some of us are language specialists, those people are like unicorns, the ones who can teach linguistics, amazing people. Um, but essentially, for us to be able to teach classic novels and modern drama and all the, ana all the analysis, all the writing skills for um, literature, and then be able to do language comprehension, blah, 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 and then be like, oh, and can you drag from the depths of their very souls some poetry that's decent? Or can you get them to write a short story, which is great, in 45 minutes, when most professional writers would take months and months and months of crafting? Um, do that, yeah, great, and then we'll judge you on it, and then decide whether you get paper progression based on that data. Uh, that's the situation we're in. And what happens when we are given ridiculous challenges like this <laughs> is that we start doing stupid stuff. <laughs> Acrostic poems? Uh, haiku, I love a haiku, but haiku are an ancient and precious art form, and really, haiku should be dealt, should be taught, kind of, should be something they come to once they can do a longer poem, because haiku is much harder than just writing something that fits the syllables. Well done, Jake. You know how many syllables are in a haiku. Um, this one, I mean, I spent probably six years teaching articles by just giving them one of these and be like, make it look like a newspaper, and then we sorted the five W's in the first paragraph, off you go, yeah, um, <laughs> and this is all because we have this vacuum, okay, we have this vacuum of knowledge, and some people get it, and some people teach it really well, I'm not saying nobody can do it, I'm just saying that there are a lot of things that scare us, and we need to be kind of, maybe thinking about how to change that, okay, so... Um, kind of just as a, I think the main reason for it is because we're looking to prepare children for GCSE style tasks. So for example, write a newspaper article to persuade people to recycle more. You've got 30 minutes. The exam criteria kind of says you need to put in some chocolate devices, you're going to be judged on your vocabulary, structure, etc, etc, etc. Children are going to write in the exam based entirely on guesswork. And we say, don't worry if you don't know facts, just make them up and as long as they're believable it's fine. Okay, so they're writing, we all say that, don't lie. <laughs> the key here is that we are preparing children to write two things like this in an hour as well. They have to do another one after this if you do AQA. Like, oh, not, not AQA. Oh, Educast. Sorry, I get so confused. I've just gone back and forth and back and forth. Um, it's not your fault, Ali, it's fine. My head of English is here. <laughs> um, so... Um, so essentially, this is very, very, very complicated, right? What we're saying to children is, we're going to get you to write an article which bears no resemblance to what a real journalist would ever do in the real world. Like, doesn't at all. But that's what the examiners want, and therefore that's our ambition. That's what we're trying to achieve. So that's a little jump we have to make, right? If we can do that in five years and they pass, we're golden. That's the problem. I would argue that if we 
stretched out this shin. Sorry, Tom, you're having to move that a lot because I, I just pace. I'll tell you what, a lot of energy. A lot of energy in this department. <laughs> So, so um, real writing, as opposed to GCSE style tasks, um, if we're actually getting children to write a good article, what we really need is to teach them proper journalistic method. So let's think about research data. How do they go about getting actual useful research data? Um, interviews, how do they interview someone? How do they interview someone to get the information they need? How do they get a range of accounts? How do they understand who's biased and who's not? How do they fact check the information they have got? Do they even know what fact checking means? Um, are they crafting their text and then able to cut and edit and write to an actual brief? Because that's what a real journalist does. Now, I'd argue that if a child can do these things, then they can definitely do that, because that's easy. You can say to your kid, this is proper writing, and that's GCSE nonsense, but you've got to do that too. So we'll teach the proper writing, and then we'll do a bit of, in time conditions, can you do this really, 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 really fast? And I know it's stupid, but you've got to do it, because everyone has. Does that make sense? The key for me is that we need to be learning from the actual writers in these fields, because we are not the writers in these fields. Okay? So the book that I'm almost finished and needs to be submitted before this baby arrives. Uh, chop, chop, ah! <laughs> <laughs> We're almost there. We're so almost there. I'm just waiting for a poet who decided it was a good idea to go to Kenya and teach some kids, which is great for him, but I'm like, Sai, I need you on the other end of it. Laptop, please. Never mind. He's amazing, so it's fine. Um, so what I've done is I've gathered together a load of professional writers from different disciplines. So I have a journalist who is wonderful. I'm a playwright. I've got a poet. I've got a short story writer slash novelist, and I've also got um, a, a, a now retired politician for speech writing. I have an academic essay writing specialist from a university in the states, um, and I have a performance poet, and then I have. Um, somebody else is a bit more complicated, but um, it's all very exciting. Um, and the idea is that these people have actually sat down with me and told me stuff about, that's totally blown my mind, about what actual writers do. And so what I'm trying to do, and what I'm going to do today with the rest of this, um, is share a little bit of how that kind of works and how you can turn what you're doing now into something that will actually be helpful kind of longer term. Um, but that's essentially the premise of the book. So. This is more challenging, it's more time consuming, but it is worth it, okay? Now, uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is based on disciplinary, disciplinary literacy, which is a concept which is beautifully um, outlined in Jeff Barton's book, Don't Call It Literacy, which has been out for a while, but it's an absolute must for English teachers and anyone who's coordinating literacy. Um, such a good book, but essentially what it means is literacy and just applying the same rules across everywhere is um, a bit pointless really because writing like a poet is very different to writing like a novelist and writing like a historian is very different to writing like a biologist and even within just the world of history writing for example there are lots and lots and lots of types of writing that students have to be proficient in so let's not teach blanket literacy across the school let's teach let's empower teachers to teach children to write in a really convincing academic way within that specific skill that they're doing at the time okay so some things i've learned from working with these writers and this is i'm going to echo what um is it did helen talk about slowing down yes well done i was like yes um, <laughs> so slowing down the way we teach things and slowing down the amount of content we're desperately trying to cover all the time is really important. So here is how I would have taught <coughs> articles over a six-week unit a couple of years ago. Week one, so you'll see, where I highlight where there's a piece of actual writing. So every week I'd be like, every single week there must be a piece of writing that I give feedback on for my unit. But that's one every week, and that's quite a lot. So we'd look at some examples, they do some writing, that's the baseline. And then we do some self-peer assessment, blah, blah. Week two, one lesson to give them some stimulus, <laughs> and then do some more writing, but in a different kind of genre. So it's a funny magazine article, because we're going to give them some variety. It'll be hilarious. They'll be totally engaged the whole way through, promise. <laughs> um, and then two lessons, feedback, redraft. Week three, 
Another example, one last, one last thing on how broad sheets work. Um, <laughs> one last in the computer room, doing some research. And then two lessons, write an article. <laughs> um, there we go. Serious broad sheets, no jokes for you lot. Um, week four, feedback and redraft from this one. One more lesson, stimulus, they're very stimulated by this point. Um, like, oh, miss all the stimulus. Um, two lessons to plan and write another article. It's an advice column. Yeah, really important that they all know how to write an agony ad column. Really um, week five, we're going to peer and self-assess this, and then straight away we're going to do another piece of writing, and it's going to be timed because that's the exam, and this is year seven, and you know it's never too early to start. <laughs> um, and then two more lessons to research a topic and prepare prepare for another assessment. Week six, assessed piece of writing in time conditions. Um, Two lessons of feedback redraft and one lesson of reflection. Because, you know, we've just, we've raced through six weeks and the kids are like, article, 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 article. And at no point have they really had any proper skills teaching. I've just gone, we're just going to write loads of things and your books will be full of writing and that makes me a good teacher. Now, that's not how a journalist works. They work quite quickly, but... The process for each article will be much slower. Okay, so how about slowing down and also trying to relate things a little bit more to the real world? So introduce a piece of writing to the students at the start. Give them a brief, like a proper brief, like a newspaper editor might give a writer a brief. So, for example, write an article for a broadsheet newspaper about a local issue which you care about. Okay, so a brief which is something which is manageable in a six-week half term. It must be no longer than 2,000 words. And the reason I put a, a kind of a word cap on there is because that's what would happen for a writer. Now, it might be really, really interesting if you did this over a long period of time and got them to do a 2,000-word version and a 900-word version because they get to understand how to prioritise the bits that they want because the 900 word version might be put into like a collection of articles all on a similar topic and a 2000 word version might be something that goes into a double page spread okay so that might be an interesting activity ensure that there is a link to reality now I'm not saying that they don't learn if it's not linked to reality but I think for writing, for writing tasks to give them something which is actually going to be read by real people. You give them an audience, okay? Um, and that's really, really important. So I would say, right, we're going to put all these articles together and submit them to the YEP. We're just going to do it because why not? It's not going to get off my nose. I'm just going to get a copy of all of them, put them in an envelope and post them. <laughs> um, and it actually is really interesting what comes of it. So my, I'll tell you in a minute um, an actual kind of case study of how this worked with my own students with letter writing. But if they have a real aim, sometimes they just go, oh, okay, it's not just miss, it's not just miss, I need to do something else. Um, so weeks one to five, teach key knowledge and skills for excellent writing in the discipline. Identify what the conventions are in a range of really excellent challenging examples. Um, teach the moral imperative of journalistic work. That first way of doing it I showed you said nothing about why journalism is important. Journalism has a moral imperative. Journalists and that third estate, they are a check on democracy. Journalists are not just there to write agony ad columns, right? <laughs> Journalists' job is to say, I've done all this research, it's been fact-checked, and that politician was lying. Whether we listen to them or not is a whole other complicated issue. Um, but this is really, really important. What is it there for? Why are your articles important? So my students who are sitting there and they've all chosen a local issue that's important to them, like the library or some graffiti or something. Why have they stopped our football programme on Saturday morning this? I don't know. Why do you go and find out? Um, why is that article important? Why is that an important issue? Um, teach research skills explicitly. Not just, let's all go to the computer room and I'm just going to sit on my computer and do some emails while you lot look at YouTube. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> we've, we've, all, we've all done it. Um, <laughs> but teach research skills how to use data and personal accounts um, from people effectively, okay? Um, teach them how to draft, redraft, edit and cut. This is so important. This is what we've lost 
this bit here, and I know that it doesn't sound that dramatic, but it really is so important. This is what we've lost, that last bullet point. We don't have coursework anymore. We've got no sense of writing something and crafting it and making it perfect or making it kind of something that we've actually organised over. You know, how can children appreciate what Shakespeare has done, the words he's chosen to use, if they don't try to craft in their own writing and they don't appreciate that, oh, do you know what, I changed that word to that word and I swapped this phrase around and I did this. They're not doing that and it's really, really, really sad. Um, so, teach them how to do it anyway. Teach them. Teach them at GCSE. Like, it'll still make them better writers. Um, in week six, you could look at applying these principles to timed exam style writing. You do still have to teach it. But what I'm saying is, by this point, they understand the process better. They've only written one article, but they've written it about 20 times. <laughs> and that's really important. So they still understand brilliant rhetoric. They still understand structure. They still understand the point. But actually, they also understand a much, much, much broader range of why journalism is important. And it becomes significant. And you're not just racing them through content, OK? Um, letters. So I did something similar last last summer, spring into summer, so with a group of year eight students and basically I said to them, right, I think we should all go to the theatre, do you agree? And they're like, not really. Uh, <laughs> it's like, right, I think we should all have a cultural experience of some description and it'll mean a trip out of school, do you agree with me? And they're like, yes, I agree. Um, <laughs> and so what we did was we spent six weeks, right, each of us, each of the students chose a company in Leeds, like a rich company. I was like, that company's not rich enough, choose a different company. Um, <laughs> uh, chose, chose a company in Leeds. Um, and each of the children, 25 kids in this class, each of them researched the company, researched the directors, researched the people who oversee their like charitable giving program, because they all have them, the rich ones, because they want some tax exemption, so don't forget that. Make them use it. They researched these companies, and then they wrote letters about our school to these companies and said, we're really poor, give us some money. Um, <laughs> they're a little bit more sophisticated than that. But essentially these letters were beautifully phrased. They were so good, like dripping in pathos. So gorgeous. So they were like, like um, so our school is one of, is it like in the bottom 0.3% for deprivation in the country? And I personally have never attended the theatre. And I want to be a lawyer. And I understand that you have a, a legal branch as part of your company. And I would like to think that a company like yours based in Leeds would be invested in its local community. So good. And the way they got to letters that were that brilliant was because we literally spent six weeks crafting and crafting and crafting and being as manipulative as we possibly could <laughs> using the written word. Um, and essentially they wrote amazing letters, amazing letters. We posted them all to the actual companies and we raised 250 quid. Like, and only two of the companies got back to us, but it didn't matter because we raised 250 quid and the theatre down the road will let us all go for that, like there's no, there's no problem. You tell a theatre, my kids did a letter writing campaign and raised this money, what can you do for us? And they'll say, well, we'll give you all theatre tickets for this show and the director will come and speak to you and this and this and this. So essentially, it's very, very, very powerful. But the most powerful thing, they all remember it and it means that now when I ask them to write a letter in time conditions, they just do it because they remember. And it was slow. It was a slow process. We didn't write six letters. We wrote one letter 600 times. Um, <laughs> it was really good and they were so invested and they were so angry. Um, <laughs> like with all the companies that didn't get back. It was really fun. I was like, should we write another letter and be like, I am incensed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I have no idea what time it is and how long I have. So I'm just going to look at my Fitbit, which is being really lazy because I can't really walk. You're doing fine for 20 minutes. Oh, beautiful. So, um, poetry. So, like I already said, I think this is a thing that's probably taught worse in schools than anything else. Um, not how to read poetry. We're all brilliant at that. We are amazing at reading poetry. That's what we love, probably, most of us in this room. If we could choose to teach anything, I certainly would be like, poems all day! But analysing poems <laughs> and writing nice essays about poems. Um, but generally, if someone says... I need you to get 30 kids to write a heartfelt, decent, well-structured piece of poetry. Um, most of us wouldn't really know where to start. Or if we did, that's pretty much all we could do. We could start and that's about it. So, 
poetry is, um, and this is broken down really beautifully in the book by an actual poet, but these are the things I have learned from him. Um, start with content. So rather than saying, we're going to write a haiku, here's, the, here, here's your box, fit in this box. Or rather than saying, we're going to write an acrostic, choose a word you like. Uh, <laughs> and again, here's a box, fit in this box. Um, let's start with content. So what he suggests doing is just starting with a free write, where children just have a black piece of paper. If your kids are the types like mine who get really scared of a black piece of paper, get them to tear it a bit. Get them to... A nice one is... Um, Guys, just check your pens are working. Give, give your page a scribble. Immediately, it's not a blank piece of paper anymore. Um, there are some little kind of little tricks you can play on them to make them be more creative. <laughs> um, sometimes I like to get them to turn a line piece of paper on its side and get them to actively write through the lines so they're not trying to write on lines. And it kind of stops them from thinking about writing a poem because we don't ever say the word poem until we actually start until we've got some content. We're not going to call it a poem, guys. You're just doing a free write. It's not a poem. Um, so, the writing. So, a free write is basically just write whatever's in your head. And it might be, I'm really tired. I don't know when lunch is. When's lunch? Why won't we shut up? What's that out the window over there? Like, it might just be a, a complete... It should just be a kind of stream of consciousness. But as that develops and as they start writing things down, they naturally start writing things down that sound nicer. So... Ideally, they do that for kind of 10, 15 minutes. You might put on some music if you want, but you might not. It depends what your kids are like, decide what they're like. Generally something like, um, not necessarily classical, but something instrumental, that, so with no words, helps, something quite calm. Um, so yeah, get them to do that. Once they have a page full of stuff, we can then start to think about content that's important. So within that page full of stuff, is there anything in there that is important to you? Is there anything in there that you think you could build on? Is there a line or two or an image or two or a few words that are interesting? Um, there are other ways of starting with content. So you can do this a blog that I wrote, I would say, seven years ago, really, really, really long time ago, on, um, which I'll retweet, called... Forgotten, forgotten, but it's something about poems, writing poems. Um, but it's on the, <laughs> one of the old ones. And it talks you through how to write a poem by just talking about an object. So all they have to do is write down what the object is, what colour it is, those kinds of things. And then it gradually goes through a process where they add more information. But essentially we want some content, yes? Then we have to learn, or students have to learn, but we certainly have to learn so we can teach them, how to edit and craft as a long, thoughtful process. That drafting and redrafting process that I talked about with journalism, it's the same for every kind of writing. So a poet might write, write a first draft of a poem in half an hour, but they might actually take weeks, months, years <laughs> over a poem. They might come back to it after a couple of months and decide that something has to change. And it's really important that our kids recognise that. We're not looking for a perfect finished piece in an hour's lesson. Because that's just ridiculous. That's not what writing is. It's not what art is. And why we don't view writing as art in secondary schools is, is an absolute mystery to me. Well, it's not entirely a mystery. It's mainly the exam fault. Um, but why doesn't writing as an art form have the same status as music and dance and drama and, and kind of you know, painting, that kind of art. <laughs> Why aren't all of those things on a par? Because if they were on a par, we'd have funding for after-school writing programmes in the same way that we've got funding for the school orchestra. And we kind of somehow have lost sight of the fact that one of the greatest bastions of art and creativity known to mankind, which is the written word, <laughs> um, just we don't teach it like that. We don't te treat it with that kind of reverence in our classrooms. So editing and crafting is a long, thoughtful process. It's something that's really, really... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's that mercurial kind of making beauty process. And it takes time, and it takes training, it takes experience, which is why I got a proper poet to write about how to do it. Um, so, but lots of resources will be free, even if you don't want to write the book. Uh, <laughs> buy the book um, on my website. So, um, and then form, it's really, really interesting. Talking to lots and lots of writers, actually, is that they don't set out to write a sonnet, or they don't set out to write a dramatic monologue. 
they have the content and through the editing process it kind of finds its way there. So it's almost like my, my cousin is a professional poet who is not contributing to my book because we might murder each other if that was happening. But he's, a, he's absolutely amazing. Um, Anna Blow, just search for his writing, it's beautiful. But he, um, he says that when he writes a poem it's almost like he's chipping away at a bit of marble and doesn't quite know what it's going to look like. He doesn't know if it'll be a short story or a, a polemic essay, <laughs> or, um, or a poem, he doesn't know, until it kind of starts to kind of make itself known to him. So that kind of thing, saying to kids, we're going to learn about sonnets in Romeo and Juliet, and then we're going to write a sonnet, it's not necessarily a great idea, because poetry is about truth, <coughs> writing is about truth, and if it's a sonnet and you're telling them to write a sonnet, they'll just contrive something into a sonnet and be rubbish. Um, or it might sound all right, but it'll be really trite, and it won't be powerful for them. So. Form will become apparent later. A writer who knows how to edit, knows how to cut, knows how to do all those things will be able to decide on what that form is. They'll land on that form because the form is needed. Does that make sense? It's like, oh, this poem needs that form. This is what it needs. This is the vehicle. Might create a new form. Might create their own thing. Um, just a few practical tips for narrative writing, again, which have come out of... Speaking to uh, Jacob Ross, who is an absolutely amazing writer, um, better known as a novelist now, um, but a short story writing is his absolute kind of, it's where he always comes back, that's where he wants to be. So, thinking like a writer, being character led and not plot led. So, one of the biggest issues we have, the biggest challenge I think for writing, teaching, for us if we're teaching GCSE at the moment, is the short story element, so narrative or descriptive, and it's because it's insane to expect a child to be able to do that in a short space of time. Um, now, this might be seen as a bit of a cheap wraparound. I don't see it like that at all. I see it as a way of being a bit more respectful to the form than um, just rocking up in an exam and regurgitating a story you've, de de you've just pre-prepared, which I know lots of people are doing, and I know why they're doing it, and it doesn't make you a bad person. It's because you have no choice. It's because you have no choice. And the children that you're sending in like that wouldn't pass otherwise. I get it. I just wonder if this is maybe a better way. So, often when children are told to like think about plotting out a story, and we say, oh, six-part story structure or something, which is actually really good, the six-part story structure. Teach it, it's important. However, what often happens is the kid says, well, this thing happens, then this thing happens, and then thing three happens, which is very dramatic, and then thing four happens, and everything's fine. Um, and you're like, so what happened? Some things happened in the story. These are the things. Um, nobody cares about a story like that because it's about things. <laughs> God, stop saying the word things. I'll forget how to spell it and pronounce it. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk to that. Um, so a character-led story versus a plot-led story. So give them an example. So a plot-led story might be... Um, Character A is late for school, they get out of bed and then they late for the bus, they have to run for the bus, it's very, very stressful, we're raising, rising, rising action, rising action guys, um, and then they get on the bus and then someone gets mugged on the bus, um, that's the story, and then character A decides that they're going to stand up to the mugger, would they, would, would they know? Um, <laughs> they decide to stand up to the mugger and then the mugger runs away, falling action denouement. Finish, yes? Now, nobody cares about that story. <laughs> no one knows. Nobody cares about character A. Nobody cares about the mugger. Nobody cares about the victim. Um, it's just, oh, things happened. Um, but actually, if it was character led and we had a story which kind of helped us understand what came before, how would a real person react in that situation? So if we'd started with a real character and we'd built our real character before we even started about starting to our <coughs> plot. So if we had a character and we knew what that character, what, what that character's experience is every day when they go to school, so what's their normal day like, do we know um, what, what's important to them? Do we know what their belief system is? Do we know what their home situation is like? Do we know um, if they have a particular religious background? Sometimes you can um, know more about the character than you even put in your story. The best novelists say that all the time. They know 90% more about the character than even appeared in the book, but that makes the 10% that was there more believable. So actually, get my students to create a character who would actually have what it takes to stand up to a mugger on the bus. And they suddenly go, oh, they might have to be a little bit, 
a little bit socially unaware to do that and think that it's it's their do you know what I mean? So if you've got a character who maybe struggles to understand social situations and struggles to comprehend their own danger, they might, yeah, stand up and say, Oh you mugger, stop it. They might do that. But most teenagers, if they're late to school, um, probably wouldn't speak up. And that's that doesn't make them bad, that's just human nature. So thinking about how a real person would react in different situations, because the worst stories when you're an examiner and you read them and you just think, oh, but that wouldn't happen, would it? It's it's like, it's like in Game of Thrones, where all of a sudden they've gone off piste and they're not doing the story that George R. R. Martin actually wrote, and you're like, but they wouldn't do that. And it's because it's not in the book. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's thing led, not character led. It's very sad. Okay. How can we connect about connect with the character? Because actually, if we can't connect with the character, we don't care about the things that happen. So we have to love a character, or we have to, even if we hate a character, that's great. We have to have some kind of emotional connection with a character. Okay. So, best advice, and I know some people do this. Um, create a character with your students that they know inside out. So every student in your class should have a character who's like their best mate. That character is going to stay with them all the way through the course. And every single time you do any kind of creative writing, you can put them in any situation. And it doesn't matter because that character is with them. It's like they're holding their hand in that exam. So that character, they know how they would react in this situation, this situation, this situation. And it makes the story, it carries itself, okay? So here's an example of one that I've been using this year with my year 11s. This is James. He is a former British Army Corporal. He served in Afghanistan. He's struggled with PTSD since coming back home. It's based on something that I read in a newspaper article. Okay, so I'm trying to find interesting personal stories. Now, he's currently homeless. Now, as callous as this sounds, characters with really tragic backstories are a win-win because they're more interesting. Someone who's had a great life and doesn't struggle with anything is a millionaire footballer. Sebastian, sorry, one of my students has insisted on having a millionaire footballer and I'm like, he's got to have some kind of tragedy, Sebastian, so make something sad up, please. <laughs> but essentially, a homeless character is brilliant because you can literally drop them anywhere. A homeless character could legitimately be in any situation because they're invisible. <coughs> so you put a homeless character in a park, that's, that sounds legit. You put a homeless character in a, um, in a theme park, could be totally legit. You put a homeless character in a situation where there is a beautiful downtown area and there's lots of sparkly lights and families are out celebrating birthday parties and things, that could also be totally legit. They're standing outside looking in, okay? So characters that you can put anywhere are very valuable. Um, come from a loving Caribbean family in Brixton. Both parents have died, no siblings. And again, I've got a backstory, okay? This is a man who has positive memories but a really tragic present okay so um what i say to my students is here's my character how would he react at a festival what would he be doing if he was at a festival you decide what kind of festival it is so the kids um, near me if anyone in here has been to the chapel town west indian carnival everyone should go if you haven't because it's the best it's older than notting hill and better just saying um <laughs> sorry my family caribbean the hair five minutes perfect so that's why it's important, but everyone should go, it's amazing. But anyway, festivals. So all my kids go, oh, it's obviously carnival, because they all go, it's the social event of the year. Um, mm -hmm. How would he behave? And they're going, oh, he'd be like, he'd be enjoying the music mess, he'd just be there standing with people. I'm like, would he though? PTSD? You know how loud those bass speakers are? How might he be at a festival? Do you think other people would be happy with him dancing next to them? Probably not. Right? So let's think about how the crowd is reacting, let's think about he's behaving, let's think about his experience of that noise and the people. Can he pay, can he go and buy any like chicken from like Mama's Chicken Hut? No he can't, he's got no money on him. So is it a positive experience for him? No. Let's think about what he would be doing. Um, another scenario, a child is lost in the park. How would he behave? So oh, clearly you try and help them. I'm like, yeah, he's a good guy. Of course he'd want to help them. How does it look if an aging black man who is homeless goes and takes the hand of a four-year-old child in the park who's not his? How does that look? Do you think he wants that experience? What would he actually do? Because this is a more complicated decision for this character. And they're like, oh yeah, of course. Um, so they come to the conclusion that actually he'd be walking, he'd be trailing behind the kid. He wouldn't get too close. He'd just be keeping an eye and hoping that eventually the child's going to find someone else who can help them. But he's going to keep an eye on them. Does that make sense? So they get their own character 
and I regularly throw new scenarios at them, okay? Um, walking past a restaurant, sees a family birthday party through the window, sees someone being mugged late at night, what do they do? Regularly meets a friend in the park for breakfast, they don't turn up for two days in a row, what do they do? So you can give them loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of scenarios over the course of two years, make it your first lesson in year 10. We're going to create our character, we're going to have a character profile, we're going to have a bio, I'm going to ask you complicated questions about this character, let's do a proper psychoanalytical profile. Um, there are loads of really great questions that I'll share on my blog that you can use. Things like, would your character rather be manipulated or the manipulator? Really, really interesting things that might make you think about them a little bit differently. Your character doesn't have to be likeable at all. Sometimes the best characters are the ones that you don't really like or that make you feel uncomfortable too. So, but anyway, put them through all those things. And then all of a sudden they've got a character that they can just drop into any situation. It's so important. Oh, good. Timing. Awesome. I was like, did I put more on here? I can't remember. Um, so, essentially, writing is so important because words enable us to describe, explore, define and challenge the world around us. Um, they enable us to write ourselves into society, <coughs> write ourselves into history, write ourselves into our own futures. If children can express themselves and ask for what they want, either verbally or writing something down then they're empowered. If they do not have the power to do that, if they don't have the ability to do that, they inevitably become the victims of people who can do that. And that is really important. We're not just teaching writing for an exam, we're teaching writing for survival, and then everything from survival up to massive, massive personal success. Okay? And let's not forget, it's art. And if we don't train the next generation of writers, then we'll have nothing to teach in 50 years. Um, apart from just the stuff we've been told we have to teach for generations before. So you literally do have the power to change everything. You do. Um, and seeing Helen's talk just before mine was really, really lovely because it ties into this. The amount of emotion that a teacher has when their student succeeds, that is because you have literally changed everything for that child and we can't underestimate the power of that. Okay? Um, that's me. We might have 30 seconds for a question. I don't know how we're yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Beautiful. Does anyone have a question? If you don't, it's fine. I know I talk really fast. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah? How do you keep your students motivated over a six week period to write one piece? Because I'm struggling with my students when I, I'm trying to get them to recraft re something like an extended process. <coughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, so first of all, if it's linked to something you're actually going to send to a real person, so like we're going to send all these to the local MP, or we're going to, we're, this is going to go to the head, or whatever, that can help with motivation. However, motivation and fun are not the same thing. And what I think is really important is that even though it's over six weeks, you've still got so much content to teach in terms of knowledge of how rhetoric works, knowledge of how different devices can work. It's still, it's not six weeks of let's just write some letters and then chill out and kind of read them to each other and, and then rewrite them. It's six weeks of like, this is how we do a really, really, really good opening. Let's look at some really challenging classic examples. Let's do this, let's do this. There, I wouldn't do the letter, the letter every single lesson. I teach the skills they need and then apply it to the same letter again and again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any others? Yes. Do you do much when you do such like creative things? Do you do peer assessment or like sort of creative just be fairness and personal? I, I I think it's worth making a judgment based on how well you know your class. I know that's really I know that's a bit of a cop out answer. Yeah, yeah. I think that when it comes to creative stuff, it's fine. Like we have to train our students to challenge each other appropriately, and if they're challenging each other about the work. So, if the challenge is, I don't think that image works very well, I actually think it's not as clear as you want it to be, or I think that that doesn't make any sense, or I think blah, 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 depending on what the text is that they're writing. If they're writing a short story, it's slightly different <coughs> if they're writing like a poem that's very, very personal. Generally with poetry, I wouldn't do peer assessment. I would do me and the student, me and the student, me and the student, because that's very, very, very personal, and texts are personal on different levels, aren't they? They're all on a spectrum. Um, with other things, I might, a bit, again, 
It's about making sure that children are trained to spot what works and what doesn't work and trained in how to give good critique to each other. Because if all they're going to say is it's rubbish, I don't like the story, then it's not, it's not going to do anyone any harm and, and any good at all. So, yeah, and it, should, it should be about the technique, not about the meaning and stuff behind it, I think, generally. Technique, technique. And if they're being taught technique really well, if they're being taught in a really academic, rigorous way, they should have the vocabulary to critique technique. Baby brain, I don't even know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where I am. Um, any more? We might have. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I work in a primary school, so thinking about um, curriculum and kind of for us, like beyond getting kids through SATs and all that kind of stuff. So you get a group of year sevens coming to you fresh in September. What, what, you know, what as somebody teaching writing would you like them to be able to do? So, do you know what, I think I flipped the question around because we have an enormous amount to learn from how they teach writing at primary school. I would say that the way they teach writing at primary school, from what I've seen, because I worked a lot with our feeder primaries, we've got five really good primary schools that feed into our school, um, often what you do is the slower way of doing it, you craft really slowly, so you do lots and lots of modelling and then children create things and they build them up slowly and I think that's perfect. What I'd really, really like is for... Yeah, often what we have to do is catch up on the lit side of things, but actually that's not a bad thing because they've got the foundations from primary. What I'd really, really like is more secondary English teachers to go into primary schools and see what they do because it's absolutely miraculous. Um, and some of the writing, so I shared some, I did some old staff training last year on challenge and my staff were like, oh, well, we're fine, we, we do really challenging stuff in year seven, it's great. I went to all our local primary schools and got some standard Standardised score, 100 kids, so average children. Sorry, no child is average, they're all perfect and unique, but you know what I mean, average, data average. Um, children, I got some work from all the primary schools, from those kids, like their best piece of writing. And I put it in a pack with work from our children in year nine. And I gave it to the staff and said, right then, you tell me, put these in order, which is most sophisticated, which of this is kind of, kind of older children, which is younger children. And they couldn't tell. And... In some cases, the year six writing was better than the... I just turned this off. In some cases, the year six writing was better than the year nine writing. And all of a sudden, people have gone, oh, how is that possible? How have they achieved this? It's like, through really, really, really good teaching, <laughs> but slower, you know? And I think that's... We need to learn something from primary colleagues that they teach writing as a proper discipline and we're teaching it as a, oh my God, they better do, we've got to do some narrative right now because it's in the exam. <laughs> it's, you, sorry, that's not a helpful question because I know you, so that's not a helpful answer because I know you're asking what perhaps you guys can do differently, but I actually don't think you need to. I think we need to do better. I really believe that. We need to up our game in year seven. They come to us knowing all this complicated grammar, all this amazing terminology. They're better at linguistics than we are. Why aren't we, why aren't we making most of that? Anyway, that's, just, that's a whole other, other issue that I get a bit angry about. Um, I think that's probably it, isn't it? Yeah, thank you so much.